So if we are going to be modest on the metaphysical side of things, the other half of the equation that realism requires is for us to not be modest when it comes to our epistemology. That is to say that we have to believe that we can indeed get it right some of the time. So uh, that if you want to be an anti-realist, the other strategy is to simply reject epistemic immodesty. It's to simply take the position that the world is just too complicated. Nature is too sophisticated for us to ever really understand to any significant degree. Maybe we can understand little bits of it, perhaps. But when it comes to understanding the sort of the whole structure, how it all fits together, that's simply beyond uh, our ability to grasp. That doesn't mean that science can't give us tools to navigate uh, those dark waters, uh, but it can never really fully plumb the depth of those dark waters. So uh, to, to reject epistemic immodesty, I think there's two, sort of two core arguments, two main ways that you can go to try to undermine this realist premise. The first is something that we've, I've already covered to some degree in this uh, series. It's, this is the, the idea of the underdetermination of theory by data. And the second is an argument that comes from Larry Loudon called the pessimistic induction. Uh, now, uh, Godfrey Smith sort of takes what I think is a strange position. He says that you can actually reject epistemic immodesty and still be a scientific realist as long as you accept metaphysical modesty. Uh, he, he, he calls this, this is a position he calls skeptical realism, which you know, I will admit sort of makes a certain degree of sense in terms of sort of mapping out the, the basic logic of it. If, if we do take these two positions, then obviously some people are going to reject both. Some people are going to reject one. Some people are going to reject the other. Some people are going to accept both. And it sort of makes sense, I suppose, to name each of these positions. Uh, but in my estimation, uh, uh, I actually think that uh, you, it can't be enough to, to say that the world is independent of our minds uh, to be a realist. You also have to say that at least on occasion, science does get it right. Uh, now, you can always, of course, be skeptical of any particular sort of scientific theory or any particular scientific field. Uh, but if you have sort of just this sort of a general pan skepticism of, that science is telling you what the world is really like, uh, then in my book, you are not really a, a, a realist about science. Uh, you're, you're an anti-realist or you know, quasi-realist, skeptical realist, eh, perhaps, but I don't know. I want to reserve the term for people who accept, uh, who accept uh, uh, epistemic immodesty but reject metaphysical modesty. I think you got to have both. So that's, that's a point where I disagree with Godfrey Smith. Okay, but let's go back to these two points, the underdetermination of theory by data and the pessimistic induction. Uh, what, what is the, the realist going to say about these two problems? Uh, well, first off, uh, the uh, probably the underdetermination of theory by data. Uh, now, again, th there is a point that has to be acknowledged here, that as a matter of logic, there are always theory, other theories that will fit the data besides the theory that you currently hold. This was a serious problem for the logical positivists because all they wanted was uh, evidence and logic and nothing else. Uh, so, underdetermination of theory by data is going to be a problem for the positivist, but it's not really clear it's going to be a problem for the realist, because an awful lot of the time, the, al the alternative theories that are being put forward aren't really scientific theories at all. They're just sort of linguistic tricks. They're, they're inventions that you can sort of make up, which do indeed fit uh, logically fit all the data, but have no sort of particular uh, motivation beyond the fact that you're trying to find an alternative theory. For example, yes, you can posit the, th the theory that invisible gnomes are actually responsible for the phenomenon of gravity, and you can you know, sort of craft a version of that hypothesis in a way that fits perfectly with all the available data that we have, and therefore the invisible gnomes theory is logically compatible with all the data that we have on gravity. But this doesn't really take uh, give us reason to take the invisible gnomes theory seriously. Yeah, if you're a logical positivist, you're in trouble here because the logic and the data aren't enough to rule out the invisible gnomes theory. But now that we've gone th as far as we have in the series, we see there's lots of ways in which a realist can sort of appeal to other sorts of scientific values to get around these problems. Uh, un Underdetermination is only going to be a serious problem for the realist if there are serious alternatives out there that match the data. Now, what I mean by serious here, of course, is open to debate. And you could uh, 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 argue over sort of which of the five Kuhnian values, for example, might be the most important ones, if it's simplicity or, or if it's fecundity or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, my point here isn't so much to unpack the idea of what I mean by a serious alternative. Uh, there's a wide variety of things which you could propose here uh, to fill in this, this uh, variable of serious alternative. Uh, but it, the point is that the realist can appeal to, to, to a host of things here that the logical positivist could not um, uh, in order to sort of rule out you know, what we might call silly theories like the invisible gnomes cause gravity theory. Um, and so that, that really is just another way of saying that there is more to 
uh, being supported by the data than simply fitting the data. Uh, you know, one sort of theory might have a more sort of progressive research program. One might be more thoroughly tested. Uh, one might be more consistent with other theories outside of uh, the particular field in which this theory is being applied. So long story short, uh, again, we've come to the point, I think, where the, where the realist is in a sort of a solid position to be able to, to not be too worried about underdetermination of theory by data. Um, but the other, uh, the other two uh, points uh, was less of a uh, articulated point. I sort of suggested the pessimistic induction before. I don't think I've ever actually officially spelled it out. Uh, so let me sort of try to give you an idea of what the pessimistic induction is before I give you a sense of how the realist is going to respond to it. Um, uh, th th this idea comes from the philosopher science Larry Loudon, who I've mentioned before, um, and it is uh, sort of his uh, sort of takeaway from the Coonian history of science. When you take a look at the history of science, almost every single scientific idea that's ever been proposed has been wrong. Uh, the, you know, when you sort of make a list of every sort of scientific thesis or theory proposal, um, uh, and then you uh, check off the ones that turned out to be false, you're going to find that you're checking off almost every single theory that has ever been proposed. Isn't it a little arrogant to suggest that now we finally got it right? After all these years of getting it wrong, getting it wrong, getting it wrong, now finally our current theories are really going to sort of uh, uh, be the ones that stand the test of time? Now, you can... You can't really sort of appeal to the same thing I appealed to a second ago when it came when it came to the undetermination of theory by data to get to escape this problem, because you can take whatever sort of scientific values that you want. You can take fit with the data. You can take the progressive research program. You can take consistency. Uh, whatever criteria you want, whatever set of values or ways it is that you're going to evaluate uh, your our current best scientific theories. All those same values at, at different points in the past supported other scientific views, which we now know are wrong. Um, you know, the phlogiston theory of uh, combustion, for example, or the ether theory of light. These were theories that were supported by a wide set of Kuhnian values, but they turned out to be mistaken. Uh, and again, not to beat a dead horse here, but this is a point I've repeated several times, the most well-confirmed theory in the history of science is probably Newtonian mechanics. It had 250 years of unquestioned supremacy in physics. And that theory turned out to be strictly speaking false. So maybe it's not entirely false, but it, 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 in the in the version that was proposed by Newton, and even the refined versions that came in the sort of decades after Newton, uh, uh, they were all sort of pitched as universal theories, and they're not universal. Newtonian theories work great in in, the, in between areas, but they break down on the quantum and the relativistic scale. Um, so uh, as they were properly understood for most of the history of science, Newtonian mechanics uh, is just false. So given that, how can we ever be confident enough to think that, say, Darwinian evolution isn't going to suffer the same fate at some point in the future? Again, that's not to say that it's false. It's just to say that we, we don't have a sufficient grounding to say with confidence that it is absolutely 100% undeniably true. Um, that level of confidence is something that the history of science should humble us from. Um, when we are, are talking about uh, uh, the, the track record of history, uh, it is a track record that should uh, lead us to being pessimistic. Uh, so hence the pessimistic induction. We are looking at the past uh, 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 and, and, and making an induction based on past failures of scientific theories to the fact that eventually our current theories will probably be false too. And this goes doubly so, of course, when we're not just talking about unobserved reality, but unobservable reality, which again is in many ways the crux of the issue between the realist and the anti-realist here. Now, one way to rebut the scientific, uh, uh, excuse me, the pessimistic induction from a scientific realist point of view uh, uh, is to sort of try to defend some kind of scientific reductionism. Uh, that is to say that the, the, the old theories of which I speak are not completely false. Um, True parts of those theories tend to be preserved in our current best theories. And, and again, the best example of this is the relationship of Newtonian physics to Einsteinian or relativistic physics. Like I say, Newtonian uh, mechanics is strictly speaking false. Uh, but that's that strictly is an important qualification there. It's largely speaking still true. Um, Einstein, Newton didn't uh, uh, wasn't completely sort of eliminated by Einstein. He was absorbed by Einstein. Uh, everything that you could do using Newton's equations, you can still do with Einstein's equations, and the vast majority of that material works perfectly well, whichever uh, set of equations that you end up using. In fact, Newton is actually a lot more convenient for a lot of purposes. When we were trying to put a man on the moon, for example, we appeal to Newton. Newton, not to Einstein. 
So the uh, the idea that uh, 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 old theories are sort of fundamentally uh, uh, eliminated, is seen, according to this argument, is mistaken. They're not eliminated, they're reduced, and the true parts are preserved. Therefore, we don't really need to be as pessimistic. Yes, based on this history, we should expect certain parts of our best theories to be disproved, uh, to be uh, reduced to other future theories. Maybe uh, you know c certain aspects of Darwinian evolution would then be uh, 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 eliminated, but the, the lion's share of it will end up being preserved, presumably transformed in some way, but still fundamentally uh, the same theory will survive any kind of revolution that we see in the future. Uh, now, again, if you pay attention to lectures on Thomas Kuhn, you know what his objection to this is going to be. He claimed that fundamentally paradigms are incommensurable, uh, that you know, the way Einstein describes mass, for example, is fundamentally incompatible with the way Newton describes mass. Uh, therefore, you can't really reduce one to the other because that's, that's what incommensurability means. Um, but of course, at the same time, again, I think, you know, it's not hard to see how we could borrow resources from the post-Kunian thinkers, specifically Emir Lakatos and, ironically, Larry Loudon himself, to try to sort of get around this objection. We can try to use the idea, not you know, we reject Kunian paradigms and instead go for something like a research program uh, of, of Lakatos's to, try to show how we can still preserve ideas even through scientific revolutions. Now, it is, of course, not entirely clear that this kind of reductionist strategy will work for all the relevant historical cases. Again, the history of science is long, there are many different cases, and there probably are at least a few cases of outright elimination when it comes to, to bad scientific theories, or, 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 or you know, previously good, currently bad scientific theories. Um, so, uh, to a certain extent, the, the proof of this uh, argument will have to be in the pudding that will come from a very, very close uh, analysis of the history of science, uh, which is something I do not have time for here. So maybe there's another strategy we can take which can sort of allow us to be quasi-realists. Maybe we don't have to fully reject epistemic immodesty. Maybe we can sort of pitch, make a pitch for epistemic semi-immodesty. That is to say that uh, we don't have to sort of completely throw out the idea that our, our theory, best theories are true. We can just say we have a different kind of confidence in our best theories. Um, that is to say that you know, we're going we're gonna to uphold to the idea that at least some of our best theories or parts of our best theories are true. We don't have to hold to the idea that the theory in its entirety is true. We can just sort of say that uh, 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 by and large the theory will be preserved uh, through any sort of uh, fu uh, imaginable future scientific revolution. Now, one way in which we might do this is, 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 is to take a perhaps somewhat counterintuitive position for a lot of scientists. Maybe we should actually be rather unconfident in our, our, our most basic theories. In, 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 in physics, something like quantum mechanics is presumably a basic theory because it's a theory about the fundamental nature of matter. And anyone who knows anything about quantum mechanics knows things that get really, really weird down there. Uh, and they get weird, not the least of which, because we can't directly observe quantum phenomena. We can only infer it from other phenomena. So maybe this epistemic semi-immodesty would say, you know what, we shouldn't really be terribly confident in our theories of quantum mechanics. But there's a whole host of other theories in science that are less weird, which are maybe not perhaps directly observable, but at least uh, are sort of cl more closely tied to observation. Think about something like the plate tectonic theory uh, of geology, right? Uh, um, this is a theory where, you know, strictly speaking, no one sees a, a tectonic plate in the way that, you know, you, you can sort of, you can't take a step back and you know, look at it from orbit and sort of see the whole thing. You can see uh, little bits of it, perhaps ridges and edges and so forth, but the, the, the plate as a whole is, is too large and too buried to see with your naked eyes. But at the same time, it's clearly something which is much more closely tied to real-world observations than something like quantum mechanics. It does not require the incredibly sophisticated and complex conceptual and empirical apparatus to, uh, to explore plate tectonics and to make predictions using it than it, uh, than it does to using quantum mechanics. So uh, that is to say, perhaps we can be realists, not so much about sort of the, the entities that our theories posit. So yeah, uh, we can say, look, we're, we're, we're going to be agnostic about whether or not quarks really exist. But what we can say with confidence is that the mathematical structures uh, that we are you know, using to, to characterize when we, when we talk about a word like quark, when we talk about a certain behavior, a certain phenomena, those under, underlying mathematical structures are fundamentally going to be real. Um, we don't have to, to posit some sort of uh, ontological being so much as just to say that we, we, we've come to an underlying sort of fact of the universe um, that, that isn't necessarily ontological but is mathematical. 
the basic equations in physics change far less frequently than the ontology. When you shift it, when you shift from the phlogiston theory of combustion, combustion to the oxygen theory of combustion, uh, the basic mathematical measurements that you make don't change drastically. Uh, it, it's simply the conceptual apparatus that you're using to make sense of the, that mathematical apparatus. Um, th this is captured uh, by sort of a, 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 an idea in quantum mechanics that says that fundamentally the way to think about quantum mechanics uh, is to just, quote, shut up and calculate. You know, you don't have to ask yourself, are these things real? All you have to do is find out whether or not the mathematical equations work and as long as the mathematical equations work uh, we are as uh, uh, we can be as scientifically realist as we need to be okay so uh, I want to close sort of the argument in favor of scientific realism here by tying it back to to, to naturalism which I talked about in the previous lecture um, and 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 the way to do that is, is by pointing to the remarkable success of science I mean whatever science is fundamentally about whether it's describing nature or making models one thing fundamentally seems undeniable it works science is without a doubt the most pragmatic the most successful uh, set of conceptual tools that human beings have ever had for transforming the world that we live in. So what the realist is going to say is if both the realist and the anti-realist can agree that science works in this sense, then it's going to naturally call for an explanation. Why is it that science works so damn well? Uh, can we possibly maybe use science to explain the success of science? That's the naturalist strategy here, um, which is going to sort of tie into an argument here for scientific realism. Um, we, we do this by making a kind of inference to the best explanation. The best explanation seems to be, according to this argument, that science tells us about the real world. Why is it that science works so well? Because there is a real world out there that's independent of our minds, and the more and more we come to know it, the more and more we can come to manipulate it and control it and develop things like GPS and... Uh, uh, a variety of other sort of technical uh, uh, machines and devices which en enable everything great in our lives, including the com computers and the internet, for example. Um, this argument is perhaps best captured by the philosopher of science Hilary Putnam in his famous No Miracles argument, which goes something like this. Realism is the only philosophy of science that doesn't make the success of science a miracle. Um, it's a, 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 a very memorable argument. It's catchy. No miracles. Yeah, again, science should rule out miracles. It would seem to be a miracle uh, to say that, uh, you know, that all this incredible scientific accuracy that we get out of things like quantum mechanics or relativity is fundamentally somehow a coincidence. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 if you ever wanted a bumper sticker argument in favor of scientific realism, Putnam is probably given it right there. Realism is the only philosophy of science that doesn't make the success of science a miracle. Uh, for the record, Peter Godfrey Smith is not terribly impressed with this argument, and I have to say, I'm not either. To use one of my uh, sort of standard go-to examples that I use all the time, Ptolemaic astronomy was a remarkably successful scientific theory. But we know today that not only was it wrong, it was fundamentally wrong. Ptolemy assumed that the Earth was at the center of the solar system and everything was revolving around it. In spite of that fundamental mistake, you can still use Ptolemaic astronomy to, to navigate the oceans very well. So again, the, my go to uh, mantra here, you can use Ptolemaic astronomy to navigate from Portugal to New York City and land within 50 miles of your destination. No GPS, no compass necessary. All you need is uh, some Ptolemy star charts and enough clear nights to see where you're going. That's an incredibly successful theory. Um, but it's not a miracle that it was successful, even though it's wrong. It's uh, it's because, for many intents and purposes, we're so far away from the stars that it doesn't really matter where the, what, what the center of the solar system is when you're looking at the rest of the universe. It might matter when you're looking at the other planets in the solar system, uh, but the other stars are so far away um, that for, for purposes like navigation, it's effectively indistinguishable. I, there's no reason to think that our current best theories won't suffer the same fate at some point in the future. Uh, that uh, you know something that we don't fully understand now about you know Darwinian evolution, for example, will will be able to explain why it is that it seems so obviously true that Darwinian evolution was correct, but at the same time also capture all the phenomena that Darwinian evolution was attempting to explain. So uh, the the no miracles argument, while a powerful one, is not without its problems. Uh, I'll close this, this this part of the lecture with this very famous uh, comic here from XKCD. Um, uh, I, I have honestly no clue what these equations are mapping or what this graph is suggesting, um, but it, it, it's incredibly amusing. Uh, just, and it, it's a, a sentiment which has been echoed many many times by many many scientists. Science 
it works, bitches. Um, uh, there's there's perhaps even a better uh, way of encapsulating sort of the no miracles argument right there, even more eloquently than Hillary Putnam did.